on this edition of the Left Bench TV. We'll have updates on the Maryland men's and women's basketball teams as they move along through Big Ten play. An analysis on how the young offseason has already had major changes on Maryland football's roster and how one Terp mom is helping out other single moms going through D1 recruitment. And an early look into the much-anticipated Maryland lacrosse seasons. The Left Bench TV starts now. Welcome into another episode of The Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Kevin McNulty. And I'm Katie Marr. It's been a hot minute since we've been behind the desk breaking down everything you need to know about the Terps, so we're not going to waste any time and we'll dive right into some hoops action. Kevin, what happened with Maryland men's basketball this weekend? Well, the question really should be what happened with Maryland men's basketball this season. It's been quite a ride. They started 5-3, and three, and then their tenured head coach unexpectedly steps down and even after losing five out of six games to start the month of January, back-to-back -back wins over Illinois and Rutgers had fans in College Park excited once again, but they were let down on Saturday. Maryland hosted Indiana in the team's first matchup of the season, and after a hot start by the Terps, things got ugly for Danny Manning's squad. With the crowd dressed in white, Maryland wasted no time taking advantage of the home atmosphere. First, it was Eric Ayala 4-3, part of a run that put his team up 8 to nothing in the early going. But Indiana had an answer, and his name was Trace Jackson Davis. TJD led the Hoosiers to a 15-3 run of their own, and this slam right before halftime put Indiana up by 7 at the break. The Terps couldn't find the bottom of the net all afternoon, shooting just 29% from the field. Meanwhile, Jackson Davis and Race Thompson dominated down low for the Hoosiers, helping Indiana score 36 of its 68 points in the paint. Maryland was never able to creep back into this one, leaving Xfinity Center at 11 and 10 overall, and just three and seven in the Big Ten. You know, Kevin, you know, Kevin I, was I was covering this game, game on Saturday, Saturday and, and I think the, think the most telling, telling sign, sign of this entire, this entire season, season so far, so far is, is that wall that was packed, packed and, then and then I looked up with five minutes, minutes, five minutes left in the second half, and it was almost almost completely, completely empty. empty. So that was that, that was a sad sight. There was a very, was a very stark, stark difference between the first half, half and the second half. half. When, you're when you're looking at the student section, you're right. It's pretty sad. Absolutely is. And Maryland will be back home tonight for an even greater challenge, taking on the number 13 Michigan State Spartans. We wanted to give you guys a little preview of that matchup, so we've got WDBM Sports Brendan Shabbat joining us virtually from East Lansing to break down what we might see on the court tonight. Thanks so much for joining us, Brendan. Thank you guys very much for having me. I'm glad to be here. I, I love when student journalists can get together, whether it's from different schools and whatnot, and, and do good stuff like this, so I appreciate it. Well, it's great, well, it's great to have you here, Brendan. Michigan State, Michigan State started the season outside, outside of the top 25, and they now, and they now reside, reside inside the top 15. 15. Maryland, 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 on the other hand, has gone the other way since opening the season, the season ranked 21st in the, in the country. country. But for the Spartans, but for the Spartans what, what has stood out to you during their ascension near the top, near the top of, the of the Big Ten? Yeah, well, first, I got to say, I was in agreement with most of the voters that I thought Maryland was going to be a really good team this year, and it just hasn't quite gone their way. Everything with Turgeon was was its whole issue, but... For Michigan State, the biggest difference between last year and this year, and this was the first year, I think in almost two decades, they were ranked outside the top 25 preseason, was that they have a point guard this year in Tyson Walker and signed him as a transfer from Northeastern. And A.J. Hogard, who was a freshman last year and had to play substantial minutes when he wasn't really ready, now is ready to play those minutes. And he's been playing fantastic the past five games for Michigan State. And, and they've just been shooting the ball really well. They were not a good three-point shooting team last year. Now they're seventh in the country and three-point percentage. They're playing really well at home. I think fans being back in the building is a huge difference for this team. They don't have a superstar, so they all kind of work together, and that could be a disadvantage, but also on a lot of nights for them, it means if someone slacks, a lot of other guys can pick them up. And Gabe Brown has Brown been the guy for Tom Izzo through 20 games, 20 games this, season. this season. What makes what him makes so him special? So special? What can and Maryland what can fans expect to see from him Tuesday, Tuesday night? night? Well, Gabe is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated and most fun players to watch in the Big Ten. Um, he's extremely athletic, a great shooter, kind of has th this, this really high motor, 100% speed and effort all the time and he's a good leader he's whether it's vocal or whether it's by action he's a really great leader and he, he his shooting is not just good and statistics and numbers but when he hits threes it seems like Michigan State's down on a, a seven nothing run and they need a bucket or they're on an 11-0 run and he hits a three to make it 14 and the game's over I mean he, he hits threes at critical moments in transition and stuff and it really lights up the crowd 
And Brendan, and Brendan the last time these team, teams actually met was in the Big Ten tournament last year, where Maryland took down the Spartans by double digits for the second time in a couple of weeks. A lot has changed since then, but what is most different about Michigan State since last March? Well, it has to go definitely back to, like I said earlier, the point guards. Tyson Kerr has not quite been the same statistically as he was at Northeastern, but I think he's been a, a huge addition to the offense in that he's – a calming presence and a guy who you know every single time Michigan State starts the ball in the half court is going to start the possession. You know, sometimes last year it was Rocket Watts. Other times it was Aaron Henry. Sometimes it was A.J. Hogard who wasn't quite ready. Now Hogard's ready. He's a great backup. They're both passing the ball really well, and they both are fantastic in transition, and that's a mantra of Tom Mizzo, defend, rebound, run. Michigan State didn't do any of that last year. This season, they're doing all of it and exponentially better than last season. Yeah, and Maryland has a new point guard of its own in Fats Russell this season, so maybe a matchup to look forward to Tuesday night. Brendan, thank you so much for coming on to talk a little Michigan State-Maryland. We're excited for this matchup tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can watch the Terps and the Spartans face off tonight at 7 p.m. on ESPN2. And our very own Pierre Bruno will have the recap after the game. Last Thursday, Maryland women's basketball hosted Rutgers and dominated the Scarlet Knights 72-55. to Senior guard Chloe Bibby went off, putting up 22 points on her bobblehead night. And sophomore forward guard Angel Reese secured her 12th double-double of the season. This was the Terps' best defensive outing in conference play, forcing 26 turnovers and limiting Rutgers to just 9 points in the first quarter. Coach Brendan Freeze credits this win to the selflessness of each player. And after that win, the Terps traveled to Happy Valley on Sunday, and they brought the heat, taking the dub 82-71. to Diamond Miller led the team with 19 points and 6 rebounds, with three other Terps earning double-doubles, one of them being Chloe Bibby, her first of the season. Mimi Collins also had herself a night with 14 points, her highest-scoring game since November. This win marked the Terps' second win over Penn State this season and their third victory in a row. The Terps now stand at 15-6 and six on the season and 7-3 and three in conference play. They'll face yet another road test as they travel to East Lansing to take on Michigan State on Thursday at 6 p.m. You can tune into the action on Big Ten Network and our Alex Gary will have the coverage of when Maryland returns home on Sunday to host Nebraska. And although the women's team was ranked fourth in the nation coming into the year, they've had to face quite a bit of adversity in the form of both injury and illness so far. That's right. TLB's Johanna Wilkoff joins us in the studio with Diamondback beat reporter Joe Latano to break down the Terps season so far as they sit in the thick of conference play. Johanna? Thanks, Kevin and Katie, and thank you, Joe, for being here. We're going to get right into it. Injury has really impacted the team's depth so far this season, most recently with Faith Msonis being out with that ACL tear. Can you talk a little bit about how her absence has really impacted the team? Yeah, her biggest impact was on the uh, defensive side in the half-court defense, um, and you see that, that, that her absence is glaring. Um, against Penn State, uh, they allowed eight three-pointers, um, most of it in the second half, and you saw a lot of late defensive rotations by them. Um, that comes as a result of the opponent, Penn State in this example, getting the shot clock down to 10 seconds and 5 seconds and really working that Maryland defense around. They're just a little bit late and they're losing patience. They have moments where they play great. They had a lot of steals, um, a lot of points off turnovers, but it's just finding that consistency without faith there for that extra front court spot. And Coach Brenda Fries has had some personal issues off of the court, and this team's facing a lot of illness and injury piling up. How, can you talk a little bit about how those struggles have really impacted their performance in the past few big games? Yeah, so you see on the defensive end, like I just said, with Faith gone, um, they lack some consistency, and that is on the offensive side too. Sometimes they're not hitting their shots. Sometimes they're not really getting in transition. Maybe the other team is making them play to a slower pace, not quite Maryland style. Um, but against Penn State, they really had everything clicking in that first half. They played in their perfect first half, but then the second half fell back on their heels a little bit. They lost that burst. They put their foot off the gas a little bit. They need to find a way to play a full 40-minute 40 uh, basketball game. Um, they play one half and kind of lose steam, um, and they're, they just need to keep their heads on straight, and I think they'll be fine. And looking forward, what is this Maryland squad going to have to do to secure a top four seed in the NCAA tournament and really live up to the hype that fans have been expecting? So this team is essentially the same team from last year. Obviously, Faith being out with an ACL injury and Angel coming out of her shell. Like, this team is in a similar spot as last year. 
The only issue is, it's not really much of an issue. They've played harder competition. They didn't have a non-conference schedule last year. Now they do. They've played four top 10 teams. They won one, lost to the three. Then Big Ten, Big Ten's gotten tougher. They knew that. They knew that heading into the season that the Big Ten was gonna be a dogfight. And now they're sitting behind three teams, four teams. So I think it's just a matter of time before they regain their footing atop the Big Ten and as one of the perennial powerhouses in the country. All right, thank you so much, Joe. And be sure to keep up with all of Joe's coverage on Twitter and at dbknews.com. Back to you, Kevin and Katie. Thanks, Johanna. And we've still got a lot to go over when we come back, including a little bit of Maryland football talk. And a look into the much-anticipated men's and women's lacrosse seasons, set to start up sooner than you think. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back everyone to the Left Bench TV. Coming off a near-perfect season in 2021 where it remained undefeated until a crushing one-point loss to Virginia in the national championship, Maryland men's lacrosse is coming in ranked second in the nation, gearing up for another run this, starting this Saturday. Yeah, you heard me. This Saturday, the Terps will open their season hosting High Point. Here's what head coach John Tillman and Brett Makar had to say about the upcoming season at Monday's Spring Media Day. We have one guy kind of dominating the ball a little bit more, uh, like Jared did last year. It, it, it works because, you know, like there's a guy that is it's a tough cover um, and he, you know, you're winning matchups and he was winning so many match, matchups last year. Um, you know, that's helpful. But in a way, you know, what happens if he gets hurt, right? So uh, I think this year we're built a little bit more by committee, which I think is a harder to defend. Um, Appreciate every day. I think especially with this group, just all the guys we had come back. I know just, you know, guys like Roman, Jake Higgins, Matt Rayhill. Uh, you know, over these last three years, been able to play with them. Uh, have grown a lot as a, as a player and a person. So really just trying to appreciate every day with them, uh, especially because I know this is my, my last year going to be able to play with them. So, uh, you know, really not trying to look ahead. And look, Katie, Maryland men's lacrosse will be without Jared Bernhardt this year. That's a huge loss. But don't forget, they are keeping a lot of their production from last year on both ends of the field. So it, it really should be an exciting season for them. Absolutely. Jared Bernhardt was the guy. Everyone knows that, but they're a deep team. They got Logan Wisnowski as the new number one. It's going to be a great season. The only one ahead of them is Virginia, who they lost to in the national championship. So we'll see what happens. We have that rematch on March 19th. And on the women's side, expectations are also expectedly high, even though the Terps are coming off their worst ever finish under Kathy Reese, which was a second round exit in the NCAA tournament, of course. But Reese is excited about her group heading into 2022. Take a listen. Look into this year, I think they've not only grown as people, but they've they've learned what's important to them and what they need to do in order to bring the team together to be successful. And for us in Maryland Cross, our culture is really important and the team chemistry. And I think these guys as leaders this year have really made that a focal point. You know, that we're back to loving what we do, we're back to enjoying our experience, we're back to loving Maryland and being an in-person class and, and having all of these other things that make our program so special and our team so special. And it definitely starts with the leadership. Someone hasn't missed a step. We bonded very fast. It's kind of shocking, but <laughs> it's easy. We all love each other. We all love being with each other. So it's made the, the like, connection really easy. You know, Kevin, you said it. The second round exit in the NCAA tournament was their worst finish under Kathy Reese ever. I think that says a lot about how good this team is. They're going to be fine, and it's going to be a great season. I'm excited for it. I mean, it's still one of the best programs in the country. They're ranked ninth to begin the year, so inside the top ten, who knows what could happen this spring. Exactly. We'll just wait and see. Still searching for its first conference win, Maryland Gymnastics was supposed to host 7th-ranked Minnesota on Sunday, but that meet was canceled due to COVID-19 issues within the Golden Gophers program. The Terps were not able to find a replacement opponent, so they won't be back in action until Saturday night at Michigan State. Maryland Wrestling hosted Michigan this past Sunday in hopes of picking up their first conference win, but the Wolverines had other plans. Michigan won 9 of the 10 bouts en route to a 40-2 victory in the dual meet. Despite the tough loss, the Terps did have one bout go their way. 
and it was Jaron Smith's. Smith came up with a huge upset victory over Patrick Brucky, who was the sixth ranked wrestler in the nation for the 197 pound weight class. Maryland is now 5-9 on the season and 0-5 in conference play. The Terps will be back on the hunt for their first conference win when they host Michigan State at the Xfinity Center Pavilion on Friday at 7 p.m. Kevin, Maryland track and field is making some noise this week, courtesy of junior Caleb Dean setting some all-time program records at the Rod McCravey invite this past weekend. That's right. Dean tied the program record in the 60-meter dash with a time of 6.68 seconds and ran the 200-meter in 21.22 seconds, the second fastest in program history. Congrats to Caleb. And as promised, we'll flip things over to football now. Coach Mike Loxley is known for his ability to recruit local talent to College Park, and early signing day back in December brought a whole new class of recruits to the Terp family. TLB's Ricky Podgorski is here to break it down for us. Ricky, what can we expect from this newest class of Terps? Well, guys, it was quite an eventful signing day for Maryland last month. The Terps were able to add 19 new signees and two transfers to the class of 2022. Of the new signees, the Terps collected four four-star recruits and 15 three-star recruits. Head coach Mike Loxley's incoming recruiting class ranks 29th nationally and 7th in the Big Ten, according to 24-7 Sports. Now, let's highlight some of the top recruits from the most recent signing day. Starting off on the defensive side of the ball with arguably one of the best pound-for-pound -pound linebackers in the class of 2022 is Jay Sean Barham. Barham is a 6'3", 230-pound big man out of St. Francis Academy in Baltimore. Barham is the 8th ranked linebacker in the nation and is already enrolled at Maryland, meaning he'll be able to participate in spring practices. Barham is a gifted athlete with elite agility and such a large frame. Barham hits gaps at the line of scrimmage with power, which allows him to get to the quarterback quickly. His strengths as a linebacker root in his ability to change direction quickly and locate ball carriers. Barham's NFL comparison would be that of Chicago Bears linebacker Danny Trevathan. Trevathan is one of the NFL's best at stopping the run game. Barham has a similar skill set and should make an immediate impact as a freshman this season. Moving to the offensive side of the ball, four-star wide receiver Shalik Knotts is the latest addition to the electric Maryland wide receiving core. Knotts is a 6'2", 175-pound receiver from Monroe, North Carolina. He's the 30th ranked wide receiver in the nation and played both receiver and free safety in high school. In his four years at Monroe, Knotts tallied a staggering 176 receptions for nearly 3,000 yards and 42 touchdowns. He's extremely talented at gaining yardage after catching the ball and breaking tackles. He can climb up and grab nearly any ball thrown his way, and he loves finding the end zone. Knotts is quite similar to wide receiver Amon Ra St. Brown of the Detroit Lions. St. Brown has a similar frame and is known for his physicality and ability to break tackles. Knotts is a big target standing at 6'2", and if he puts on a little more muscle, he will be a force to be reckoned with. Another four-star recruit joining the Terps offensive attack is running back Raymond Brown out of Midlothian, Virginia. Brown is the 10th ranked back in the nation and is a 6-foot, 212-pound stat sheet stuffer. Brown tallied 146 carries for over 1,000 yards and 14 touchdowns this past season alone. Brown is a fast and agile back that breaks tackles in the blink of an eye. Brown is quite similar to running back David Montgomery of the Chicago Bears. Montgomery is one of the NFL's fastest running backs and one of the league's best at breaking tackles. Remember the name Raymond ba Brown because he will certainly be a contributor for the Terps this season. Yeah, guys, Maryland is losing a lot of its wide receivers to the transfer portal. So that's making Copeland's addition even more important. He spent the first four years of his career at Florida, and last season he was one of the Gators' main pass catchers. That was a season in which he led his team with 642 receiving yards and scored four touchdowns. It's a guy who's from the state of Florida, got to play for the Gators, and then after Florida fired its head coach Dan Mullen, he had an extra year, decided to come up here. Copeland isn't, even, is the, isn't the only transfer who Loxley has added. In addition to Jacob Copeland, former West Virginia linebacker Vendarius Cowan is going to join the team on the other side of the football. Cowan, not to be confused with the former Maryland men's basketball point guard, started his career at Alabama in 2017 when Mike Loxley was on the Tide's offensive coaching staff. He then transferred to West Virginia and played three seasons, and he already seems to know Maryland a bit, he recorded a season-high five tackles against the Terps when the teams met in last year's season opener. However, the Terps have seen much more subtraction than addition through the transfer portal, particularly in this receiving room. While they still have Dante Demas Jr. and Rakim Jarrett returning to join Copeland along with Octavius, Octavian Smith Jr. and Shalik Knotts, who Ricky was just talking about, 
Seven of Talia Tangavailoa's top targets are saying goodbye to College Park. Three of them are seniors, deciding to use their extra COVID year elsewhere. Brian Cobbs, Daryl Jones, and Carlos Carrier. Cobbs caught 25 passes for 319 yards in 2021. The Alexandria native is going to look to keep that up as he heads out to Utah State. If you watched the Terps win the pinstripe bowl at Yankee Stadium, you probably recall watching Daryl Jones have a career day. He all the two touchdowns during a dominant win. After four years as a Terp, the former four-star recruit is joining the NC State Wolfpack. And Carlos Carrier had a breakout game against Indiana here back in October. He stepped up amidst the team's injury woes. In the fall, Carrier will be in the Mid-American Conference, looking to help Central Michigan back to a bowl game. Now, Katie and Kevin, it's not just receivers who are on their way out. You know, Terrence Lewis was once a five-star recruit when he came here and was the number one linebacker in the country. Well, after not seeing any action in his freshman year, the Florida native is going back to the Sunshine State, transferring to UCF. Former four-star recruit Brandon Jennings, another Florida native, appeared in eight games this year and made three starts. But it'll be a new start for him in the fall as he joins Kansas State. So basically, they lost some older players who were, who were going to be, you know, had an extra year and they decided to use that elsewhere. They lost some younger guys who hadn't really gotten to have their moment yet. And they got a couple of big pieces on both sides of the football. Yeah, and not to talk about, there are rumors that Kevin Steele is about to join as the new defensive coordinator. Was at Auburn for four years, had a long-standing relationship with Coach Loxley, so that should add some... Some something to the defense. Well, some something. <laughs> I mean, they need it. As defense was probably the weaker side of the ball for them last season. Certainly a lot of turnover this offseason for Maryland. Not all of it bad. That's just typically how it goes. But it will be exciting to see how things shake out come September. And especially with all these guys jumping around with, you know, the extra years of eligibility because of COVID and all that. So another factor thrown into it. Yep, trying to keep track of all these extra COVID years is like proving impossible at this point. <laughs> well, it is certainly going to be an interesting 2022 season to watch unfold. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it, Shane. And now don't go anywhere and start casting your ballots for our top five plays, Terp of the Week and Pro Terp. And TLB beat writer Logan Hill will also be joining us to play Guess That Stat. And I'll tell you how one Maryland football mom is helping other single moms navigate D1 recruitment. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, welcome back. It's finally time to crown the top five plays of the week. Now, there was a lot to choose from, but trust me, everyone, we've got some good action that made the cut. Oh, boy, you know I like wrestling highlights, and we talked about this one earlier. At number five, it's Jaron Smith with this incredible upset over Michigan's Patrick Brookie, which ended up being the only bright spot for Maryland on Sunday as they fell to the Wolverines 40-2. to Look at him flex. Gotta, you gotta love it for him. In at number four, we've got Maryland Gymnastics it girl Audrey Barber, who came back for her fifth season, leading the way for the Terps on floor, earning a 9.8. She is so good. The Terps may have dropped this meet to Rutgers, but Barber did become the fifth all-time leading scorer in program history by the end of the day. And one can only imagine how easy it'll be for her to reach first place by the end of this season. Certainly one of the best to ever do it here in College Park. And for number three, we will look to Maryland women's basketball showcasing their unselfish play with this ball movement from Chloe Bibby to Diamond Miller, then across the court to Ashley Owusu for three. This team has been decimated by injuries this season, but if those three are healthy, better watch out in Minneapolis where they're having that final four. Oh yeah, and at number two, it's Fats Russell shooting it up and big man Caduce Wahab slamming it down. So good, we have to watch it twice and in slow-mo. You know we love slow-mo. While Wahab's been struggling on the court lately, he had 12 points against the Hoosiers on Saturday, so he just might be on his way to finding his footing in the Big Ten. 
It's Caduce's time to shine. And now your top play of the week comes from Emma Silberman. You may remember the last time she performed in Xfinity Center, she suffered a torn ACL on her bars dismount, but what a comeback for the junior. In her first meet back home, she's looking graceful and strong as ever, leading the Terps on beam with a 9.75. Congrats to Emma on the recovery and being our top play of the week. You know, I was there when she got hurt in the Big Five meet last year, and I was there at this meet against Rutgers, seeing everyone freak out for her. She stuck her landing on bars, killed it on beam, and did great on vault as well. It's a great full circle thing to see. Yeah, it's been a long road for her over the past 10 months, but it's, it, seeing her back out there probably means everything for her. It really does. And crowning titles doesn't stop at top five plays. It's now time to name our Terp of the Week, and there is literally no one else we could have picked other than everyone's favorite Australian, Chloe Bibby. Thursday's game against Rutgers was Bibby's bobblehead night, and her parents came to see her play all the way from the down under for the first time in two years. So it's no surprise at all that she balled out. She, Bibby had 22 points, seven boards, and two blocks against the Scarlet Knights. And she was also named the Big Ten Player of the Week honor roll today. Congrats to Chloe on a great night and being our Terp of the Week. Turning our attention toward the NBA now, where some former Terps have been making a lot of noise. Even Maryland star from last year, Aaron Wiggins, who is this week's pro Terp. Wiggins was originally drafted 55th overall by the Oklahoma City Thunder last fall. And even though the Thunder reside in the cellar of the Western Conference, he's been getting significant minutes out in OKC all year. Wiggs is averaging 7.5 points per game over his last 10 and shooting at a 44% clip over that same stretch. It's great to see that guy building an NBA career right before our eyes. You know we always love to see some Wiggins action. And speaking of basketball, I recently heard that the Left Bench now has a podcast called The Right Bench, hosted by our very own Noah Ferguson and Logan Hill. And now Logan Hill is kind enough to join us to play a little game we debuted on the pod last week. You guess that stat, I think we called it? That is, <laughs> and credit to Noah. It was his game first, but we've adapted it and we brought it for you guys. Yes. Let's go. So just to get started, our first one we have here is two starters this season are averaging more points at home than they are on the road. Which two starters are they? So we're looking at Dante Scott, Akeem Dante Hart. Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart were the first two that came to mind. Let's, you know, let's go there. Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart. Yeah. Okay, Final you guys, answer. You guys are half right. Uh, Hakeem Hart was correct, but the other one is Caduce Wahab. Oh. All other two Maryland starters are averaging more on the road. But Maryland's only played five true road games this season. Moving on to question two. Maryland lit it up from three against Rutgers last Tuesday, shooting almost 50% from the field. What's the only other game this season where they've shot a better percentage? I think I know this one, and I think it's because when we were at the Rutgers game, they said that was the second, first time they've scored that high beyond from the field since the first of the season, which was Quinnipiac home opener. Close. It was against Florida back in December at the Barclays Center. They shot, I believe it was eight for 13, which is a slightly better percentage. Well, that actually makes sense because I would consider that their best win of the year, taking down a ranked Florida team uh, up there in Brooklyn. They did shoot the lights out that day. That makes sense. They really did. And then the last one I have here for you guys is um, which Maryland starter is leading the team in free throw percentage, granted that they've taken at least five attempts this season. You know, we're going to battle this one out. I'm going to say Fats. I was also going to go Fats, Russell. <laughs> and you're both wrong. It's oh. Hakeem Hart once again. Mm. Leading the team is 85% from he the free throw line. He always kills it at home. He does. Fats is a pretty good free throw shooter he himself. Is. Don't worry. I think Ayala is somewhere in the 60s, which isn't quite as high as you'd expect him to be. So that's why I didn't guess him. Um, we were really terrible at that game, yeah. weren't we? Did we? We lost all of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, we lost didn't get we didn't get a them. single correct. Hey, answer. we got we got Hakeem Hart in the first. So that's true. Yeah, you guys. We were like one so for bad. four or something. I think this is my show now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome Logan, to the right take bench over TV. From now on. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Logan. That was fun. We look forward to doing more of that with you. And be sure to check out the Right Bench podcast on Spotify and Apple. And Apple. Thanks for having me, guys. Now, before we go, we've talked a lot about college football recruiting, and I recently talked to one Maryland mom who had a unique perspective with that process. We all know who Jay Sean Jones is, breakout Maryland wide receiver back in 2018, who had the game of his life against Texas as a true freshman. But you may not know what his mom now does for other single moms going through what she once did.
when he left, I was lost. I mean, literally lost, wandering around the house. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have anybody to cook for. I didn't have anybody to drive somewhere. I literally did not know what to do with myself. When single mom Nicole Barron was going through the D1 recruiting process with her son, Jay Sean Jones, she found herself in an entirely new world. I had no idea what to expect or any type of timeline or how any of this went. Jay sean has been here at the University of Maryland for the past four years, while Nicole's been keeping herself busy with her new passion project, Single Mom's Guide to D1 Football Recruiting. There was a lot. And so I was unloading on all my friends and they're like, you really should write this all down. Like someone could really benefit from this. I thought it was a great idea because there are, there's, there's a lot of other parents that are kind of in similar situations or uh, people with similar situations to that where they haven't been through the process and kind of need help. Nicole's advice ranges from early signing day to at-home visits, how to deal with coaches, scholarships, and to injuries, something Jay Sean has now dealt with twice at Maryland. She's been a huge help in, in both processes, um, especially the first one, like, because I, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, that was the first time I've ever, I had ever had the game taken away from me. She just was there for me at, at, all the time. Like, if I needed a call, if I needed a text, FaceTime, it, 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 she was there as much as she could, could be being it, it was tough but she, she helped a lot she's even had a blast taking things to tiktok i enjoy he does he kind of rolls his eyes at my tiktoks but i have so much fun i tease him all the time i'm like they should have never let me get on this app that's my favorite part it's just i'm having a blast with it i'm, I'm so proud of her like that, that's the biggest thing for me is just knowing that she's happy like that's all i ever want because that's like that's my mom so that's all I ever want for her. And then just seeing that and having that come through is, is definitely a blessing. Nicole says she's gotten tons of feedback and thanks from moms everywhere. And she has one piece of advice she wants all of them to know. College football is a business. Do, you cannot get emotional. It's a business and you got to make sure that um, you as a product are going to fit well there and flourish. You know, Katie, it's really heartwarming to see somebody like Nicole take an experience she had a few years ago and turn it into something positive for other single moms. Oh, 100%. That's what she told me she wanted to do. I had a blast talking to Nicole and Jay Sean. Thank you guys for letting me tell your story. Um, yeah, single moms in D1 recruitment, not something you think about a lot. So good on Nicole for doing something about it. Really great work on that. And that'll do it for this edition of The Left Bench TV. Be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Left Bench. We'll see you next time.